I'm Lucy Beadnell with the ARC of Northern Virginia, and today we're going to be looking at home and community-based Medicaid waivers, or Medicaid waivers for short. We're going to be looking at this kind of through the lens of COVID. Not a whole lot has changed with the waiver system in the time of COVID, but as we go through um, the standard parts of this presentation where we talk about what waivers are and the services offered and how you apply and whatnot, I'll share some tidbits with you about how COVID may have changed things, if at all. Okay, so a little bit about what we'll go through today. I'll talk briefly about the ARC of Northern Virginia. We have been around for more than 60 years. We're one of the nationwide network of ARCs, and all ARCs have the same mission, which is making sure that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a full life in their community. Their human and civil rights are protected, and they have what they need. Beyond that, ARCs fulfill that mission in very different ways. Um, our chapter does a lot of advocacy, so that's making sure people with disabilities and their families know what's going on that could affect them at the federal, state, and local level, and are really involved in speaking out and making sure that the changes that occur are positive. So if you're interested in that, I would love to talk with you more about that. That's something we're doing really heavily this summer. We do a lot of education, which is things like this workshop, um, lots of online toolkits, one pagers, three minute webinars, kind of a whole cadre of ways for families to learn, read, hear, listen about ways to access services and supports and to navigate challenging times. We do a lot of information and referrals. So if you've got a specific question you want us to help you answer, we're happy to do that for free. We are case managers for individuals who use the DD waivers that we'll be talking about today. So that's a cause near and dear to my heart. Uh, we are public guardians of last resort for a few people in Northern Virginia who really truly need a guardian but don't have anybody else to serve in that role. And we operate a special needs trust, which is a way to save money without jeopardizing eligibility for things like Medicaid waivers. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, briefly later in the presentation because it does tie in closely with waivers. And then we have this awesome tech for independent living program, which are things like travel mate and safety mate and apps on the phone that can be a travel trainer or a safety coach or a job coach in your pocket with a program totally customized to the person with a disability. Um, very, very cool stuff that's going on. So going on from there today, we're going to talk a little bit about what a Medicaid waiver is and why they exist and then how you know if you're eligible. From there, we'll go on to looking at what some of the waiver services are and then how you apply to receive those services. And because a number of the waivers have waiting lists, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like um, in terms of time to be on a waiting list, in terms of navigating that waiting list and things to know, things like that. Then we'll go on a little bit to talk about what happens when you have a waiver and some of the things that you do to keep and use that waiver and what that looks like. And then, like I said, at the end, we'll have my contact information. So first, the purpose and description of waivers. Medicaid waivers have been around in the country since the 1970s and in Virginia since the 1990s. And the purpose is to give states flexibility for how they fund support services. So prior to the 1970s, you had to live in a hospital or a large institution to get any publicly funded help. And after a series of lawsuits and civil rights movements in the 70s, um, that started to change. So a waiver really is waiving the requirement that states only offer services in a certain way and saying, let's break that mold. Let's allow people to live in their community, to work in their community, to do what everyone else in the world has the option to do and will pay for those supports where they wanna be. The term Medicaid waiver um, is interchangeable with the term waiver for the purposes of our presentation here. It's called a Medicaid waiver because Medicaid at the federal level and the state level work together to write the rules and to pay for what the waiver services look like. So they're very heavily involved. And a waiver, like I said, really is just a technical term for saying we're waiving some of the usual requirements for how services are offered and funded and those kinds of things to make sure that people who need the most services can get those services in place. Waivers are really important and we talk a lot about them. Um, they are meant to be essentially a one-stop shop for people with developmental disabilities and their loved ones trying to put together services. So for people with a high or a low level of need, for people who are young or aging in place, for people who need a lot or a little supports, all those kinds of things, all of those ongoing supports are funded through a waiver. And it really is the only public, meaning free or very low cost, way to get ongoing support services funded, especially in a number of places of your life, like 
work plus supports for transportation plus supports at home. Really the waiver is the only way that we offer that. So incredibly important, even if you just think you'll need a few of the waiver services, because this is the only way that you can get access to them. We're gonna look at essentially what I'll call two types of waivers. Um, there are developmental disability waivers, and you can see those here at the top of your screen. Uh, the three are the community living, family and individual supports and building independence waiver. Those three waivers share eligibility criteria and they share an application process and they share a waiting list. So for a lot of what we're talking about today, they're essentially functioning as one. I'll call them our three DD waivers. And because so much of what we're doing with them is identical, we're really looking at them as a block of one type of waiver even though there are subtle differences we'll get into when we look at waiver services. The other type of waiver in Virginia is the Commonwealth Coordinated Care or CCC Plus waiver. In the past, this had been called the EDCD waiver. That term may sound familiar to some folks. Um, and it was also called the Tech waiver. And in 2017, overnight, those two waivers merged. There was a handful of differences in services and eligibility criteria between the two and the state essentially just chose to smoosh them together for um, kind of bureaucratic reasons. It just made more logistical sense for them. So as we talk about waivers today, for example, as we talk about how you know you're eligible and what services are, we'll keep going back and forth between the developmental disability waivers and the CCC plus waiver so that you can see are one or both sets of these waivers applicable and how you'll pursue them. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and start fulfilling that promise. So we'll look here first at our DD waivers. For the DD waivers, you have to have a developmental disability diagnosis. So that's things like autism, cerebral palsy, a big host of um, chromosomal issues, all kinds of things. Um, the list is incredibly long and there isn't a single finite list. So what the state is looking for generally then is, do you have a psychological evaluation that shows there's a developmental disability? and an IQ score, those kinds of things, and that's what we're looking for. If you have any questions about whether or not something's a developmental disability, let me know. One of the things that tends to trip people up is things like ADHD or a learning disability generally are not considered um, a standalone developmental disability for the purpose of this waiver, but all kinds of other things are. The DD waivers have a really full menu of services for both living at home, in your parents' home, in your own home, um, in a home with other folks, working, having supports during the day, having supports overnight, having nursing supports, having a, kind of a big cadre of options. So really a um, large menu of services with the DD waiver. And like I mentioned, up to 24 seven support if you need it. So if you need a wake staff 24 hours a day, that's an option with the DD waiver. The DD waiver also comes with a case manager, which is really critical. Um, as you'll see as we get on with this presentation, waivers can be really complicated, and a case manager's job is to help you navigate that, to kind of be your Sherpa, to make a plan based upon what the person with the disability wants and needs, and put waiver services in place that meet those needs, but also other community support services. So if we find that someone really wants a volunteering opportunity, how do we hunt that down and find the right choice for them? And how do we pair waiver supports with that opportunity to make them successful if they need it? Those kinds of things. Um, the downside to the DD waivers though, is they do have a long waiting list. And like I mentioned when we went over our outline, we'll talk more about that later. But so DD waivers kind of think of anyone with a developmental disability, big range of services, lots of things that you could need, but you'd have to wait for them. Now we'll look at the CCC plus waiver. You need some kind of disability diagnosis, which could be a developmental disability, and a medical need. So this waiver is unlike the DD waiver, which is meant exclusively for people with disabilities across a lifespan. The CCC plus waiver is aimed to divert older adults from nursing homes. There isn't an age minimum though. So sometimes if you have a developmental disability and some medical needs, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get in depth here, um, you're eligible for this waiver. It has a much shorter menu of services than the DD waiver. There's no um, day or employment kind of equivalent. There's kind of limits on nursing care. Uh, there's a significant cap of 56 hours a week on personal care, that kind of one-on-one -on -one care attendant to come work with you and help with you. There isn't a case manager to help you navigate the waiver and put a lot of pieces together, but there is no waiting list. 
So if we're looking at them on balance, the DD waiver is where most folks with developmental disabilities want to end up because it's got the big list of services, but the CCC plus waiver can be a bit of a lifeline for people who uh, have some medical needs in addition to their developmental disability and can get some services at least through that waiver in the meantime. For a little bit of perspective, at any given time, the DD waiver has a waiting list and about a third to a quarter of the people on that waiting list are able to use the CCC plus waiver because they also have a medical need. So, um, so the reason we're talking about the CCC plus waiver today is because there's a significant minority of our world for whom that's a real big help while they're waiting on the DD waiver. Okay, so now we'll look at eligibility. And like I mentioned, with everything we talk about, we'll go back and forth between the DD waivers and the CCC plus waiver. So eligibility comes in what I'll call three prongs. For waiver eligibility, you need an appropriate diagnosis, functional need, meaning the supports you need match with the supports that waiver offers, and financial eligibility. Because these are Medicaid programs, we'll talk about what that looks like. So for the developmental disability waiver, the diagnosis, like I said, is really coming from a psychological evaluation. That can be an evaluation done by the school, an evaluation done by an independent psychologist, um, all kinds of ways to get those sorts of evaluations, public or private insurance, all kinds of things. Um, if you have questions about getting one of those done or the age of your evaluation, something like that, feel free to chat it in and we can talk about those. But really what we're looking for is before age 22, a disability on that we think is going to continue and it significantly impacts this person's life. If we're looking at a child under nine years of age, that criteria is even looser. Under nine years of age, we're not really even looking for any kind of IQ score or maybe not even a hard and fast diagnosis, just significant um, gaps in development or delays in development compared to peers. For the CCC plus waiver, it's a little bit different. You won't be submitting a psychological evaluation you're going to be looking more at, yes, there's some kind of disability, and you could submit a psychological evaluation to show that, or there's other kinds of paperwork that would show that there's a disability present, right? Something a little less comprehensive. But the nursing need piece is what tends to be um, the bigger hurdle for folks here. In the middle of the screen, there's a link to a fantastic self-assessment for CCC plus waiver eligibility that will talk to you about um, do you need help with bathing, dressing, using the restroom, those kinds of things? Okay. Do you need help with G-tube feeding, with um, medication planning, with physical therapy, with those kinds of things? And it's a really good checklist and quiz to go through to get a sense of whether or not you're eligible. With the CCC Plus Waiver, there's no list of medical needs that make you eligible. It's really based upon do the medical needs you have require some specialized training to be met. So for example, we'll go back to range of motion exercises. If you need range of motion exercises, is a prescribed physical therapist coming in to offer those on a regular basis? Then you may need eligibility or do your parents do those exercises for you, but a physical therapist had to teach your parents how to do them and they gave your parents the kind of the medical order to continue doing those exercises. So it's either you've got a professional coming in to provide some medical supports or someone in your life had to be trained by a professional to do that. So often folks who have G-tube feedings or those kinds of things, even if parents are doing those G-tube feedings, you had to be trained by a nurse to do that. So that's the kind of thing that would count. Um, as you can see, there's lots of shades of gray there. So again, I would refer people back. I think that's a great self-assessment. It'll take you a handful of minutes and it'll give you a really good sense of do our medical needs meet that threshold. Um, now we'll look at functional eligibility. And again, starting with the DD waivers, there's functional eligibility for these waivers is assessed with a scoring instrument called the VIDES, which is an acronym for the Virginia Individual Developmental Disabilities Eligibility Survey, which is quite a mouthful, but is really accurate. It's in Virginia. We're looking at the eligibility of folks who have developmental disabilities for this waiver. And we're going to look at a number of life areas in your communication skills, in the way you manage money, in the way you manage personal safety, in the way you manage behavior supports and learn new things. In all these realms, we're going to look at what supports you need to be successful. The VIDE survey is available on the ARC of Northern Virginia's resource library page. If you go to the arcofnova.org and click resource library, which is at the top right corner, and then click waivers, 
as kind of the section of the library, you'll be able to see the VIDES instrument. There's one for wee little ones under three years of age, one for kids three to the day before you turn 18, and one for adults. And you'll see that the sections are exactly the same and the questions are very similar. They're just a little bit updated for what we would expect developmental, developmentally um, between those age gaps. And one thing I like about the VIDES is it was revised in 2016 and is now written in much more, I would say, family-friendly language. So I would say, go to our website, look at it, practice the questions, score yourself. You can flip right to the front page and see, oh, based upon the way we answered our questions, I'm confident that we're eligible. Or based upon the way we answer the questions, I can see we're right on the cusp of eligibility and I can see where those kind of tipping points are. So when I sit down to actually do this form with the person who's gonna determine our waiver eligibility, I'll know that I really need to emphasize these questions or this section or make sure these kinds of things are really clear because that's where our eligibility hinges. So it's a great way to plan ahead. Um, the VIDE survey is really important for eligibility, both getting on the waiting list for a DD waiver and then every year that you have a waiver, you'll do it again. So you'll definitely become familiar with it. Just make sure you're comfortable with the questions. If the person with a disability is the kind of person who maybe doesn't have the most accurate uh, sense of self and would say, I need help with nothing. I can fly rocket ships to the moon. I am the most capable person on the planet. Giving them a heads up of what the survey is going to look like um, is a good idea. Giving the surveyor a heads up as you go into it about what that's going to look like is a good idea so that everyone's as prepared as possible. For the CCC Plus waiver, that instrument is a little bit different. Instead of using the VIDES, they use something called the Uniform Assessment Instrument, or UAI. And if you've ever had a loved one who had a stay at a nursing home or a long time stay at a hospital or rehab facility, it would be the same form that they used. The VIDES, like I said, you can flip right to the front and see, yes, based upon the way we answered the questions, I am or am not eligible, I can see that. The UAI doesn't have that kind of scoring cheat sheet, if you will. It is, in my opinion, fairly repetitive. So you will get a sense of, am I saying yes to a lot of these questions or no to a lot of these questions? Um, it'll give you a sense of the kinds of things that they care about medically. So it's another way to get a sense of whether or not you think you'll be eligible as you get going with things. So we've talked about diagnostic eligibility for the DD and CCC plus waivers, now functional eligibility between the two waivers, and financial eligibility for the two is essentially identical. So uh, in 2020 dollars, people are allowed to have 300% of the current supplemental security, social security income per month. So to, in today's dollars, that equates to people can keep these waivers if they, the person with the disability, have an income of $2,349 per month or less. If the person is a child and they have no income and we would expect them to have no income, easy peasy. If that person is an adult and working, we just need to make sure that their working uh, earned and unearned income total is less than $2,349 per month. And like I said, this number adjusts uh, essentially with inflation, with social security inflation. Um, once someone with a waiver is earning, again, just the person with a waiver is earning more than about $1,200 a month, then, oh, goodness, we zoomed way in there, uh, then they're going to have what's called a patient pay, which means that they're going to have to have a copay for their waiver services. Uh, that copay is usually close to 100% of what they're earning over $1,237 per month, but there are exceptions to that. Um, there is a resource limit for adults of $2,000. That means the adult with a disability cannot have more than $2,000 in assets to keep a waiver. So that would be things like a checking account or savings account or stocks or bonds in their name, those kinds of things. Um, they are allowed to own one house and one car that is in their name and used mainly for their benefit. There is no resource limit for children because we don't consider children to be legal property owners. And to be really clear, the income and assets of parents never count. There's never a situation in which parents' income and assets will disqualify someone from a waiver no matter the age of the person. Okay, so we'll go on here and so now I'll come back into special needs trust, which I mentioned at the beginning. We operate a special needs trust at the Ark of Northern Virginia because we see how critical these are for folks who may want to use waivers, 
but don't like the idea of living in eternal poverty, never in their entire life having more than $2,000 to their name. And the answer to that conundrum is to open a special needs trust. A special needs trust allows the person to save any amount of money or any amount of assets and still be eligible for a waiver because the items that are held in the trust, be them um, a home that's held in the trust or uh, cash or stocks or property or whatever you have that's held in the trust isn't counted against their Medicaid eligibility. So it means that the person can have assets and can save for the future and can do all kinds of other sorts of things. Um, a special needs trust is similar to an ABLE account, which folks may have heard of too. There are differences between the two um, and we've got a ton of information on special needs trust and ABLEs and kind of figuring out what's the most um, effective savings vehicle for you or your loved one. The director of trust at our office is Tia Marcelli and she's brilliant. And um, I would certainly suggest contacting her. She does a lot of free info sessions online now that we're in the time of COVID. That's our first COVID special here. Um, those are all online <laughs> uh, because we're not able to meet with folks in person. So I wouldn't hesitate to kind of tune into one of her live info sessions and kind of talk through, okay, if we're looking at waivers and we're looking at social security and other kinds of benefits, they're going to care how much we have in the bank. Is a special needs trust the right tool for us? Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about services. And again, we'll go back and forth between the DD and the CCC plus waiver, but we'll mostly be able to look at them on the same slide. So first we'll take in a quick peek at residential services. So the three DD waivers here are listed at the top. The community living waiver, that's for waiver with the highest level of need. You may need 24 seven awake staff and that's the waiver that's the best fit for you. The family and individual supports waiver is people, um, the majority of folks who need more than a kind of someone dropping in on occasion, but maybe don't need someone awake with them 24 hours a day. And the building independence waiver is for folks who maybe can be all right alone overnight or alone for significant portions of the day, or maybe need someone who just drops in on a regular basis to help with financial planning and meal planning and those kind of higher level executive functioning pieces, but can do a lot of the day-to-day -day things themselves. So as a bundle, again, those are our three DD waivers. And then on the far right side of the screen is the CCC plus waiver. So we'll go through and kind of see how these things stack up against each other. So with residential services, you'll see um, the community living, one of the three DD waivers offers your traditional group home, which is a lot of unrelated folks. Um, sometimes usually mixed age, sometimes mixed gender, living in a home with staff who rotate in, in and out 24 hours a day. Um, the 24 hours a day option has really been stepped up in the time of COVID. A lot of folks who are using this option now, um, staff overnight had to deal with the reality that folks who usually went to employment and day programs weren't leaving and residential providers have been working overtime. So I've talked with a few folks in the last handful of months who have said, Oh, I'm really interested in exploring residential services. I'm not getting a call back. And residential providers are just up to their neck trying to um, make sure that they've got staff in the homes and they're doing everything they can to keep people safe. It's a significantly intensive model. It really is designed for folks who need um, kind of the, maybe not line of sight supervision all the time, but pretty close to it. Maybe a line of ear supervision. Folks always within hearing distance to offer help 24 hours a day. Um, all three of the DD waivers offer a service called shared living, where someone with a disability lives with someone else, generally someone without a disability. That person without a disability is there overnight, and they can sleep overnight, but they're there if the fire alarm goes off, if there's a strange issue, if someone calls out for help in the night, they're there. And you can layer in other supports on top of that, but that option is new, and it's a nice option for someone who may say, you know what, my loved one's not safe alone overnight, but they don't really need someone awake looking at them overnight and helping them to the bathroom and those kinds of things. Um, the building independence waiver has a service called independent living where skill building services, for example, to help someone learn to do their own meal planning or their own deep cleaning of the house, those kinds of things are brought in as needed. Um, there's a service under the community living waiver called sponsored residential, which usually looks like the person with a disability moving into the home of a non-family caregiver. So for example, a special education teacher who has decided that this is what she would like to do instead says, yeah, I've got expertise in working with people with disabilities. Yeah, someone with a disability can come live with me. I'll sleep overnight, but I'm there for them overnight. During the day, I'll be there to support them. On the weekends, you know, they're living with me. They're part of my household now. And maybe they go to their own job during the daytime and that's when I have my time off. 
them, but it's a kind of a, a more family parallel model, if you will. And then there's a supported living model, um, which would look like a much smaller scaled customized group home. Usually we're looking at two to three folks with a disability, usually who chose each other in advance, living together, staff coming in as much as needed. Um, but unlike a group home, which is much larger, more people there, more staff there, it's kind of a, a more tiny customized model. And in Northern Virginia, for cost reasons, that usually looks like a condo or a townhouse kind of thing. Notice that our CCC Plus waiver doesn't have any residential services. And I put that on here for comparison. So when we talked about the DD waivers having a long waiting list but a real robust menu of services, this is one of those examples. So now we'll look at day and employment services. And again, I'll point out that the CCC Plus waiver has none. There's no day and employment services parallel option for someone with just that waiver. You will see that all three of our DD waivers really offer the gamut of day and employment services. That's everything from you go to a large center where it's mostly people with disabilities and their paid staff who work on skill learning or arts and crafts or other kinds of meaningful things during the day to someone with a disability who um, needs drop-in staff a handful of times a month but otherwise has been taught their job and knows it really well and gets along well with their coworkers and can be pretty independent and everything in between. You know, small groups of people with disabilities working together with small groups of teams or coaches, um, volunteering opportunities, going out in the community and life skill learning. And our waiver system is trying to move towards a system where you don't just have one waiver service for day and employment, and that's all you ever get until you're ready to make a 100% leap to another. Because we used to have a waiver service called pre-vocational meaning getting you ready for work. And when the Department of Justice came into Virginia a few years ago to investigate what Virginia was doing, they found some people have been using pre-vocational services for 30 years, which really does beg the question, when do we get to that vocation we've been promised? And before um, 2016 or so, our waiver system really was not set up to allow people to move from one day in employment services to another really gradually. It was really tough to say, okay, I've needed day program supports, a staff person with me all the time, and now I wanna work independently. And there was, it was hard to find a bridge between those two. And the way the new system is set up, it's designed to make it a little bit more flexible so that folks could get authorized for many of these services within the same week. And for example, some way, days do employment training, some days do life skills training, some days do community-based activities, some days do volunteering, all those kinds of things to grow people's skills and independence and, inabil and abilities over time. All right, so now we'll look at in-home services. And in-home, I really mean to say in whatever home the person with a disability is living in, other than a group home kind of residence. So if they're living with their parents, if they're living in an apartment with friends, if they're living by themselves, all those kinds of things, services brought into their home. And you'll see our CCC Plus waivers finally on the map here. So the in-home services are really things, usually a one-to-one -one caregiver. Sometimes that caregiver is there to provide you know, like help with bathing, dressing, using the restroom. Sometimes that caregiver is there to do things like help the person learn new skills, build their independence. Sometimes that caregiver is there to do things like companionship and make sure that person has a peer mentor and a friend. Um, the waivers come with respite care. So whatever services you set up, you'll have I don't know, I'm making this up, 30 hours of employment supports a week and you'll have 50 hours of residential supports a week. But let's say your parents who usually provide some care during the course of the week are out of town or are ill or have other things going on, um, then you can bring in respite care. So uh, that respite care is an additional pool of hours you can pull on through the course of the year when you hire someone you would like to come in and help provide some of those extra gap services. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about respite care in the time of COVID. One of the big challenges is that um, obviously people with developmental disabilities are more susceptible to COVID-19 than to the typically developing population. As a result, even folks who have a waiver have been really hesitant to use it because they're afraid of that caregiver or multiple caregivers coming into their home that could accidentally transmit that virus. And so um, it's been interesting helping people navigate this time because our families we know are absolutely desperate from, for some extra supports and resources, but also really hesitant to accept those extra supports and resources. Some families have offered their caregiver the option to temporarily move in with them so that that caregiver doesn't have to go back and forth to the grocery store to do all those other kinds of things. Obviously that doesn't work for everybody. 
Um, some folks have told their caregivers not to come. Some folks have gone from having multiple caregivers to asking just one to come to try and limit the pool of um, folks who may be coming in to expose them. This is really all over the map. And um, Virginia has adjusted our waiver system in a time of COVID to say, usually we need to make sure you're using a waiver service at least every 30 days, right? You're actively trying to use this. But during the time of COVID, they said, we'll make all kinds of exceptions. If you need more support hours because you're willing to have folks come in and you need them, we'll work with you on that. If you're not gonna use any services because you just don't feel comfortable leaving the house or having someone come in, we'll work with you on that too. So those are very unusual flexibilities, um, but the state is doing some things to try and adjust in a time of COVID, knowing that needs and support options look very different. Most folks now are not going to day and employment services. I would say very, very few are. Day and employment services are just looking at getting up started again, probably later summer, some even beyond that fall and winter um, of 2020. So uh, it's a great testament to how the waiver is designed to flex with your needs over time and not only your needs change, kind of society and our circumstances needs change. Um, so with all that being said, the waivers also offer environmental modifications, which are changes to your house or car to make it safer or more accessible, and a PERS and emergency monitoring system. So if that person with a disability is going to be alone for a significant period of time, but maybe can say something's up and push a button that will call 911 and say, you know, this is Anne, she has Down syndrome, she has a speech impediment, she has a heart condition, if this button's pushed, just go ahead and send an ambulance, as opposed to Anne having to know the right person to call and to identify her name and address and describe her symptoms and those kinds of things. It's a really fantastic system that's helped people live more independently. In that same kind of vein, there's a waiver service called electronic home-based supports that's just getting off the ground. It's all this kind of new smart homes, tech savvy sort of stuff, stoves that automatically shut themselves off, doors that automatically close themselves or lock at certain times of the day um, so folks don't forget to lock their doors overnight. All kinds of really cool remote monitoring stuff for folks who may take electronic prompts better than human prompts or for folks who may be safe on their own if we have some remote monitoring and supports there um, but who otherwise would need paid staff there. And so it's a great way to grow independence and um, to make independent living a more significant option for a lot of people. All of the waivers offer assistive technology. So that's um, money for essentially portable technology devices. And I would say by far the most common are things like iPads and communication software to go with them. It can certainly be all kinds of other variations, but that's what I see a lot of. Um, the DD waivers offer crisis support, both coming out to your home if you're in the middle of a crisis or a crisis respite home. Um, and some other new services are getting on board. There's a community housing guide coming for folks who may want to live independently, but say, whoa, I am way overwhelmed by the idea of filling out all this paperwork and doing all these things. Can someone help me? The answer is yes, and the waiver will pay for that. Um, there's a non-emergency medical transportation reimbursement that's coming online that would mean you could give your friend or family a small reimbursement through the waiver for driving you places if transportation was a barrier for you. So the waiver is growing and flexing. We had a lot of new services offered just in the last handful of years that are really still getting off the ground. Um, and then quickly looking at kind of nursing and therapeutic services, um, by and large, the waiver offers these as needed. I'm gonna move my little box here so that you can see. Um, how that looks. So the CCC plus waiver does offer some nursing services like the DD waiver does um, and some services to help people move out of an institution. So if you have a loved one who's had a significant stay, 30, 60, 90 plus days in a mental health institution or a hospital or a rehab facility related to their disability, um, the waiver can help them discharge from that and come home with support services, sometimes without a waiting list at all. So I would say that was a lot about services. If you are applying for waivers, you are either going to be put on a waiting list and you don't need to memorize all this. You'll kind of be on that waiting list. And at the time that you come to the top of that waiting list, someone will walk with you through these services and you'll put in place the services that make the most sense based upon your needs at that time. If you're applying for the CCC plus waiver and you're going to get services right away, you'll still get someone who's going to come out and walk with you through this in a bit of depth. So I don't think it's important to know all the ins and outs of services, but to kind of get a flavor of what may be available so you can raise questions and start planning and thinking about it. Now we'll talk about applying, and again, we'll go back and forth between the DD and the CCC plus waivers.
So screenings for all of the developmental disability waivers are conducted by local community service boards or CSBs. Those are local government agencies who are contracted by the state to do all the screening and assessment and all that kind of stuff for people with developmental disabilities. So the phone numbers are here and that's a matter of starting with a phone call. Even now in the time of COVID, you can call, you can ask to be screened for the waiver and to be put on the waiting list for a waiver. Um, you can still work through most of that, if not all of that process. And CSBs are becoming more and more savvy about trying to do virtual assessments. A lot of this always has been done on phone and through paperwork and things that were mailed in. So some of this adapts pretty well. So given that we're in a pandemic, don't let that stop you from applying for these services. If you feel like there's something you're eligible for, absolutely go ahead and do that. I talked with someone at Fairfax CSB recently who said that they're able to do most of the intake and we're working on the rest. I talked with someone with Arlington recently who said that they think they've got people all the way through the process. So again, we're all doing our best to adapt. For posterity, this was filmed in late June of 2020. So um, folks are doing, again, their very best to kind of get things up and rolling and to be creative about ways to get people on the waiver waiting list. For the CCC Plus waiver, you're not calling the Community Services Board, you're calling your local Department of Social or Family Services, and those numbers are here on the screen. And you're doing usually a screening right there on the phone, whereas with the DD waivers, you're saying like, hey, I'm interested, they're mailing you out your paperwork, you a more of a quickie call. Here, I would be planned to sit down on the call and really talk through some of those medical and nursing and hands-on care needs. And if they feel like you are eligible, then they should hook you up with a nurse who may do a virtual visit to talk in a little bit more depth about those needs. And because that waiver has no waiting list process, services can get going pretty quickly, assuming you're willing to accept them and do all the paperwork. Um, it's bureaucratic quickly, right? It's still the process of applying for Medicaid and doing all the state paperwork and those kinds of things. I would say in non-COVID times, for folks who were doing their best and saying, yep, I'll take the first appointment to talk to you. Yep, I'll return my paperwork the day it gets to me. Yep, I'll meet with you as soon as we can. Yep, I'll get right on making these calls and lining up my services. That things usually got started in two to three-ish months, sometimes four to six, um, if folks drag their feet. Um, I'm not quite sure if I have talked to enough people who are applying in a time of COVID to give you a good sense of how long it may take now. Um, some things are slower and some things are faster because less people are doing them. So again, don't let the fact that we're in the middle of a time of COVID prevent you from trying to apply for and access these services. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the waiting list for the DD waivers. And of course, the very fair question when you hear the word waiting list is how long is that waiting list? And I would love to give you an answer. Um, it's really unpredictable. So right now in Virginia, that waiting list is just under 13,000 people, which is a tremendous number. Um, about 3,000 of those 13,000 are most urgently in need. So we've got to serve those folks first. This year in our state government, we made a plan with our two-year budget to take off half of that urgent needs waiting list, which was a big win. And then COVID happened and we clawed some of those waivers back, which was a loss. We kept most of them. Um, of the, oh goodness, 1,600 waivers we got, I think we kept about 1,300. Of course, new people are getting on the waiting list all the time. Sometimes folks have a situation where their needs were not urgent and suddenly they are. Sometimes folks have a situation where their needs were urgent and suddenly things calm down. So the waiting list is very much in flux. I mean, I think years ago we asked what the average waiting time was and we were told something around eight years. And I would say, <laughs> I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that, right? For someone, if you're applying for someone who's about to graduate from high school, someone who's in an active crisis with a parent who's recently passed away, if you have some real urgent things going on, you're going to get a waiver faster. If you are doing all the right things that you can by planning ahead, applying for a young child who is relatively healthy and safe with parents who are healthy and safe, and you've got most of the supports you need, but you know you'll need a waiver one day, yes, the reality is probably you will be waiting for a long time, um, which skews the waiting list data. The overwhelming number of people who are on the waiting list are under 22 years old, are young people who are planning. Um, so that's important to know. I do think it's fair to say that if there's a true emergency, child or adult protective services involved, the caregivers pass away, I mean, the real heavy duty, deep in real life happens, then there are emergency waivers that can be put in place without really having to wait, but that's for truly exceptional circumstances. Um, 
For people who are on the waiting list, you're put in one of three priorities. Like I mentioned, there's about a quarter of the folks on the waiting list in that priority one, most urgently in need. And then the rest of the waiting list is fairly evenly split between being in priority two, kind of medium need, and priority three, which would be that young, healthy, planning for the future. A waiver really would be great, but we're managing okay otherwise because we have a CCC plus waiver or supports from school or private supports or whatever else it is that you've got in your bag of tricks there that you're using. Um, I do want to draw attention here to the fact that even though the waiting list may be long and if you think we fall into this like my child's young, really healthy, we're going to be waiting for 10 years, why would I bother doing this? In part I would say seize the time of COVID. <laughs> if we're all at home, um, check something off your to-do list. Also, if there ever is a true emergency or crisis, you want to be able to pick up the phone and call the community services board and say, hey, remember that waiver we applied for? We need it now, as opposed to saying, oh no, things are really awful. Who am I supposed to call? What paperwork am I supposed to find? When am I gonna go have these meetings with folks? That's a really scary time to be starting an application process. So I would say, have this in your back pocket. Be on that waiting list. It can only benefit you. It truly is not a huge heavy lift to get on the waiting list. Handful of phone calls, two, three meetings, some paperwork, nothing that parents of kids with disabilities are not used to at all. And you'll really have done something huge to plan for the future. And also there are years when our General Assembly makes much bigger funding commitments to the waiver as opposed to other years. So you never know on the years when we're going to buy down on that waiting list and you could have been swooped up, but you thought, oh no, I'll push that waiver waiting list off for a few more years. We won't get funded anyway, right? You want to be swept up in all those good tides that we have. Another huge benefit to being on the waiting list is that you're eligible for up to $1,000 a year to so apply for $1,000 a year and what's essentially grant funding called the Individual and Family Support Program, and it's for supports that would help the person with a disability. So things like respite care and summer camps and adaptive equipment and medical co-pays and all those kinds of things are really common requests, but they're very flexible about what you can ask for. So $1,000 a year in money that, um, again, is very flexible and accommodating, that's not a particularly arduous application process in most years, is definitely worth doing. Um, that program usually opens in the fall of each year. So my suspicion it's gonna open in the fall of 2020. It's gonna open sometime between July 1 of 2020 and June 30th of 2021, because that's our fiscal year, but it's gonna keep opening every year. So by all means, absolutely take advantage of that. It's a huge benefit. Um, like I mentioned, about a third of the quarter to people who are on the waiting list for the DD waivers, use the CCC plus waiver in the meantime. So if you have those overlapping medical needs, do that. Wait for one, use the other. And then when you get the DD waiver, you give up the CCC plus waiver. But like we saw on the chart, any services you add with the CCC plus waiver, you can get and more with the DD waiver. You'll only be adding to your bag of tricks there. And then for anyone who's on the waiting list, you're in our system. So it's much easier to access crisis services if you have a loved one who regularly or even intermittently experiences um, mental health or behavioral crises. It's a really critical thing to have in your back pocket. Some folks you can call to bring some help on board. Now I'm gonna talk quickly about what it looks like when you have the waiver, just for a little bit of perspective. So once you receive the waiver and then every two years for kids, every three years for adults, you sit down for a really long meeting that's still happening just virtually in the time of COVID called the Supports Intensity Scale or the SIS. And you're really talking through in a lot of depth the help the person needs and how often and how much and what does it look like. So it's similar in concept to the VIDES that we talked about that you do to apply for the waiver and you do every year, um, where I would say the VIDES usually takes 30 to 45 minutes. This takes like three to four hours. So it really is pretty in depth. Um, from that SIS, you get a numerical score that puts you into one of seven support levels, ranging from least support to most support. Those support levels are then grouped in two tiers. And this is kind of important to understand. So if you look at tier one in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, seven-ish percent of our population fall into that category. Those are the folks who we most expected to be using our building independence waivers. Folks who really could be alone or were ultimately going to be alone for significant portions of the day or night need some drop-in supports here and there, maybe some help on the job, some kinds of things around the fringes, um, but don't need a ton of support. If you group tiers two and three together, you get about 80% of our population. 
And that's the folks we expected with that family and individual supports waiver, that middle tier DD waiver, meaning you don't have to have someone awake with you 24 hours a day. You may need someone sleeping around over, sleeping nearby overnight. You may need someone there most of the time. You may need someone there every minute that you're awake, but not overnight, right? It's kind of that um, opposite of extreme sort of per person. And then tier four, you get the remaining percentage of our population um, who really have significant medical or behavioral or hands-on care needs, really do need 24-7 awake staff, and those are the folks they imagine using those community living waivers. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective on how um, this, and it's, and I would say it's not broken down that way. It's not like you do a CIS and you automatically get the waiver that correlates um, with your CIS score, but that's kind of how the state is planning, and when they're looking at awarding waiver slots, they're looking at we got so many community living waivers this year and so many family and individual supports waivers this year and so many building independence and we're pairing those up with people on the waiting list so if you're on the waiting list and you've said my needs are the highest of the high they shouldn't be offering you anything other than a community living waiver which may mean a longer wait um, and if you are offered a waiver that you think is a lower support tier than you need you can take it and you can try it and then you can ask to be bumped up to another waiver. It at least gives you a chance to get some supports in the meantime. Okay, so uh, the CIS tiers matter because if you're gonna receive any kind of group services, group employment, group residential, the higher your need, the higher service providers are paid to take care of you, which has a fair logic to it. Um, but the larger your group, the less service providers are paid to take care of you. So for example, if you say we've got a high needs person living in a house with seven other high needs people, then we'll say, well, you still only have one house, right? So you probably still only have one house manager. Some of your overhead is absorbed amongst those eight people. But if you say we have four high needs people or two or three high needs people living together, then the reimbursement per person is much larger. The services are much more customized. Okay, so let's talk about more information. There is a state waiver hotline and waiver website, and we have a waiver website. Um, I would say none of those Websites have information related to the kind of changes going on during COVID because things are very, very fluid, but you're welcome to ask me questions about that and our state chapter is doing a great job of putting out some COVID related information for waivers. Always you can contact the ARC of Northern Virginia or your local community services board to ask questions. I mean, people ask, I'm on the waiting list. I haven't heard from you in a while, or I'm on the waiting list. I want to update you about this new urgent need that we have. And that need can be COVID related, right? If you are experiencing undue stress and strain, maybe both parents are essential workers and have to go back, or both parents have lost their job and the supports that you were previously able to fund privately have evaporated. All those kinds of things are worth calling and letting them know. Um, we certainly would encourage everybody to become a member of the Arc of Northern Virginia. Donating any amount of money makes you a member, and that's what enables us to keep things like our website and these webinars and everything we do free. Um, here is contact information for me. So if you go to the arcofnova.org slash answers, you'll just type in like your name and your information and a little bit about what your question is, and I will respond to you. Unless you ask a very strange question that's unique to one other person on our staff, I'm the person who's gonna respond to you. Um, I don't have an office phone right now because our office closed in March and I don't know when they will be open again. So online is absolutely the best way to reach me right now. So with all that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and start looking through the questions that folks asked and chatted in feel free to keep those questions coming as I'm talking. And like I said, always feel free to reach out to me after the fact. Okay, so what is meant by, meant by communication category? Does that include social skill deficits? So I'm guessing this is about the VIDES. So when we talked about if you have a developmental disability and we're looking at what those needs are, and we're looking at that VIDES assessment that says, are you eligible for the waiver? There's a category about communication. I would really suggest, again, going to the arcofnova.org, click resource library in the upper right, click waivers is the section in the library and look at the VIDES assessment and you can read the communication questions. It really isn't about social skills. It really is about um, the person's ability to understand prepositions. Can they put simple words and phrases together? Those kinds of things. The social skill piece um, to some degree is assessed in, sorry, I didn't mean to slide us all around there. The social skill piece to some degree is assessed in the behavior category. So for example, if someone, um, never makes eye contact, stands way too close to people when they're talking, doesn't use an appropriate volume, those kinds of things that are social skills, those are assessed in the behavior part of the VIDES and mission it's there. So uh, next question is, are Virginia disability benefits similar to Maryland's? 
We are relocating to Maryland in a few weeks. Um, yes and no. So uh, all states have entirely, every state has a Medicaid waiver system. All states are totally different. Virginia's is a contract between Virginia and the federal government. Maryland's is a contract between Maryland and the federal government. Um, Maryland has an autism specific waiver. Maryland has a, a matrix of how services are funded between support needs and size. It's way more customized than ours. Um, United Cerebral Palsy puts out a mostly annual report that I highly recommend called the Case for Inclusion. So a quick internet search for United Cerebral Palsy Case for Inclusion, and it just came out in 2020 in the spring, um, ranks states by what kind of services do you offer? How long are people waiting? Are the services inclusive and of good quality? Historically speaking, Virginia has been like low 30s and 40s and Maryland has been second. Um, if you'd call folks in Maryland, they would say, it's not like we're living in an oasis here and everything's fast and easy. So I would say anytime that you're looking at moving from state to state, services don't transfer, waiver services don't transfer, and state to states can look very different. So by and large, moving to Maryland, things should look better. Um, Maryland, like Virginia, uh, has some big income disparities in different parts of the state. So if you're moving, for example, to Montgomery County, which is a more wealthy part of Maryland, you are more likely to get locally funded services and other kinds of things that are in access um, that may not be available in other parts of the state. Just like in Northern Virginia, um, there's some locally funded services outside the waiver that you can't get in other parts of the state. Okay, so if you're currently on the DD waiver waiting list and relocate to a neighboring county, do the neighboring counties work together or will I have to start all over? Oh, great question. So no, you don't have to start all over. A move within Virginia is usually pretty simple. Um, I'll go ahead and make my contact screen big again there. Um, moving within Virginia usually just means for the DD waivers, you contact your neighboring community services board and they essentially transfer your paperwork over. So the only thing, if you're if it really is just a neighboring town, oftentimes your service providers don't even change, right? Because your service provider, if you're going to them and you're still able to commute there, great. If they're still able to come to you, great. Sometimes nothing really changes at all. Sometimes folks really like their community services board case manager and say, can you hang on with me for a little bit? And they can't promise that and I can't promise it, but sometimes they're able to stick with that person for several months and sometimes even years after they transition um, to a new town. If you're moving somewhere way across the state, we at the Ark of Northern Virginia had a few folks in the last year who moved to Williamsburg. We can't realistically get to see you at Williamsburg on a regular basis, so we were able to stay on long enough to get folks transitioned. Um, for the CCC Plus waiver, because that's not managed by community services boards, it's managed um, really by the state at large, moving from county to county is even easier. Again, you're, you're notifying your Medicaid eligibility worker, you're notifying anybody who gives you waiver services, who you're in contact about the waiver, you're making sure all those things get updated. But moves within Virginia are usually not a big deal um, with some kind of quirky exceptions if you have locally funded services. Okay, so I see that same question there about moving to another county, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer that, okay. So the next question is, why if they do not consider the parent guardian financial status, are you penalized in trying to obtain a waiver or push down on the waiting list? It seems that selection processes severely penalize your position on the DD waiver list based upon the parent's guardian health status too, and don't put much weight on. Okay, so I understand this question. So prior to 2016, if a parent or caregiver, one, was 55 or older, you were bumped up on the urgent list, and the older they were and the more older caregivers you had, the higher up on the waiting list you go. Um, that waiting, that has changed. And you're right, really they're, they are relying upon parents to self-identify as whether or not they have the means to provide the support their child uh, needs either through private funding or through their private insurance or through whatever, meaning they're less urgently in need of a waiver because they're getting some help otherwise, um, and that parent is in good health mentally and physically. Um, if the parent has any health challenges mentally or physically, they can share those on with the community services board, and that puts someone higher up the waiting list. But yes, absolutely, and one of the incredible cruelties of having a waiver system that's so underfunded is you're right. If you've got families that are relatively well off, relatively healthy, managing okay, even though they need services like everyone else, they are given a lower priority than folks who have maybe a loved one with the same needs, but don't have financial needs to provide for behavior services or respite care 
or maybe have a parent who has diabetes and is in the hospital a lot and um, isn't able to provide supports to their child. So really your status on the waiting list um, has a lot to do with family situation, not just the needs of the person with a disability. And I would say the only justice that I'm able to find in that is in eliminating the waiting list. I don't think anybody should be waiting for critical disability services. And that's why we do a lot of advocacy on that. And I would love for you all to join me there. Do I have a phone number to apply for the DD and CCC plus waiver in Prince William County? Sure. So in Prince William County, if you just um, do an internet search for Community Services Board Prince William County, it should come right up. And for Department of Social Services Prince William County, it'll come right up for the CCC plus waiver. I will do, I made myself a note, I will write down that you would like me to send those out um, in my follow-up email and I'll put them there too. But if you don't wanna wait for my follow-up email, you should still be able to just on a quick internet search. So it's um, Community Services Board, Prince William County for the DD waiver and Department of Social Services, Prince William County for the CCC plus waiver. Okay, are speech, occupational and ABA therapy considered medical needs for part of the waiver? Ah, this is a great question and something that um, I would say is not in my experience, interpreted 100% consistently with folks who administer the waiver. So yes, those are specialized medical needs. Yes, if they are prescribed therapies and the child is actively getting those therapies in school, at home, in school and at home, I would very much emphasize those needs. And I would say they are likely to be eligible for the waiver. That self-assessment link that we looked at way back in the beginning, and again, you'll get a copy of the slides um, that looks at, you know, do you have these kinds of needs? Whatever. I would say do that and get a sense of the specific kinds of things that they're asking so you'll know what exactly to emphasize. But yes, generally speaking, if the person has a number of specialized therapies that are prescribed and are being actively provided, I would say that is likely to qualify them. Okay, I'm not seeing new questions coming in. So I'll do some wrap up talking and feel free to keep sending questions now and I'll get to them before we end. But again, anyone who registered today will get a copy of the slides. If you're seeing this later, anyone can go to the arcofnova.org and select our resource library. And under the Medicaid waiver section, we've got um, kind of like a one page quick reference guide. It really is two, it's the front back of a page on applying for waivers. So it'll be the quick look at Here's the DD waiver, here's how I know I'm eligible, here's the number I call, it's your quick look if you wanna go back and do that. Um, other resources like the VIDES are there on our online resource library. Anyone is always welcome to contact us at the arcofnorthernvirginia.org. And our YouTube channel has a close to 100 videos and we're always weeding them out if they're out of date about waivers. So on our YouTube channel, and I'll send out a link to that, there's a three minute version of like, what's a waiver? If you just wanna wrap your head back around that, or how do I navigate the waiting list? Or what is that CIS assessment they talked about? Or any of those kinds of things we try and have three minute versions of. And if there's something you feel like we don't have, let me know, and I love creating those resources. So any questions you have, anything that you think that you need, let us know, and we're really happy to put them out there for you and for everybody else please feel free to be in touch. And we would invite anyone who's um, with us today to join us live tomorrow morning, Friday, June 26th from eight to 8.30 for our benefit breakfast. And it's free to join and you'll learn for about 30 minutes about what's going on with the Ark of Northern Virginia. And we would love for you to become members and donate because you're so moved by our great work. But no matter what, it's a great way to connect in this time when we all feel so disconnected. And I'll send out a link to register for that in our follow-up from today. Thank you all so very much and stay well.